Now, one thing I thought was really interesting about the book, and, and, and actually quite uh, counter-conventional wisdom, is you say that the political leaders, the top of the pyramid, are typically not the ones to blame for response to catastrophes when they go amiss. It's usually inside the system. It's usually mid-level technocrats and bureaucrats. Explain that, because that's certainly not the way we've been pointing the finger uh, in response to coronavirus over the past year and a half. Well, of course, it's very easy, tempting, and, and perhaps irresistible to blame the person at the top when a disaster strikes. And Last year, uh, it was pretty much the default setting for most journalists, certainly liberal journalists, to blame Donald Trump. And their counterparts in Britain blame Boris Johnson and their counterparts in Brazil blame Jair Bolsonaro. It, it was the simplest way to tell the story that you had a populist in power and that was why there was excess mortality. But there are a few problems wrong with this theory. I mean, one is that there were plenty of countries that didn't have populist leaders that did just as bad or worse. Uh, and that, that, I think, was often overlooked in some of the coverage. But the most important argument, Ian, that the book makes is that in most disasters, when people are inclined to blame the person at the top, on closer inspection, the point of failure is not there. When the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up, initially the press wanted to somehow pin it on Ronald Reagan, who was then president. It was 1986. And they wanted to say, oh, the thing blew up because they rushed the launch because Reagan wanted to reference it in the State of the Union. And this was total nonsense. There was no such story. It turned out that the real problem was that the NASA engineers knew there was a 1% probability the thing would blow up on launch, but that had been turned by the NASA bureaucrats into one in 100,000. And that was the point of failure in reality. The engineers knew how dangerous the shuttle was. I tried to show in the book that that's often the case, that although the buck stops with the president, in reality, when a disaster occurs, it's not really the president who's the key person or the key institution. In the case of COVID, if you ask the thing, the, what the things were that caused excess mortality north of half a million in the US, presidential decisions don't come near the top of the list. CDC's failure to ramp up testing was very little to do with President Trump's decision making. Uh, the, the failure to develop any kind of contact tracing that works didn't happen because the president vetoed it. It was big tech that decided not to do it. We were terrible at protecting the elderly in care homes as they were in Europe. That wasn't presidential. And then, of course, quarantines just weren't enforced in any efficient uh, or effective way. That's not got to do with the president. So in the book, I argue the president said a whole range of very dumb things. He misunderstood, he miscalculated, he misled the public. He became more and more reckless as 2020 went on and the election got nearer. But he that's not really time. why. He wasted time, though, no? I mean, you were asking before, you said, you know, what was happening in February and March? I mean, the Americans, especially compared to Europe, the Americans had time. That time was wasted. Was that a systemic issue or was that a president issue? Well, oddly, oddly enough, if one goes back to January, Trump understood and some of his advisors understood that there were things that could be done. And it was Trump who, uh, who argued for a ban on travel from China in January for which he was roundly criticized uh, in the media for overreaction and, of course, xenophobia. And I think Trump's instincts as a populist were, in fact, to do travel restrictions and to, to close the borders. He was talked out of But to it, tell the American the... people that there was nothing to worry about, it was going to go away magically, but, let's but, keep them on the cruise right. ship because that'll keep the numbers down. I mean, come on, you have to admit those things, Neil. Absolutely. And I make the point repeatedly that, that Trump went worse and worse off track. But the initial impulse, uh, I don't think, was completely wrong. What happened was that other people in the administration said, oh, but hang on, we've got an election coming up. You can't do anything to derail the economy. Uh, and, and Trump knew that this was bad. I mean, at least uh, we, we understand this from some of the people who talked to him last year, uh, but was persuaded by some people in the administration who won the argument that it was better to gamble that it was just the seasonal influenza rather than to risk the election by derailing the economic recovery, which was what he was going to run on. On this point, at least, that decision of whether or not to gamble the economy because the election is coming up or to say heavy on, um, we, this isn't a big deal, uh, that, that decision ultimately is made by the president of the United States. 
Oh, absolutely. But remember, the key failures that led to the excess mortality, as I said earlier, if you're trying to ask what really caused the excess mortality, those weren't presidential decisions. And it's hard to say what percentage of the deaths you can attribute to presidential decision making, but it's certainly not as high as, say, oh, this is like pilot error when a light aircraft crashes. Being president of the United States is not like flying a light aircraft. And the decision making process in an emergency isn't at all like that process. So I think the point of failure really doesn't lie at the top. It lies with the people whose one job it was to do pandemic preparedness, who did it on paper, but suspected rightly that in practice, the pandemic preparedness plan would be of very little use at all.